Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, friends of AI, Earth and Sustainability. Um, first, I would like to welcome you, everyone, to this new talk in the seminar series of AI uh, for Earth and Sustainability Science. This seminar series in the program AI for Good of the ITU is co-convened by myself, by Michael Reichstein, Johan Densler, and Maria Piles, and was actually initiated some years ago in the context of the Excellence Network Ellis for the development of AI in Europe. Um, first of all, thanks for attending this meeting, all of you. Uh, today we will hear about fast statistical inference with neural networks and amortization, uh, with special emphasis in an application of special, special environmental and geophysical applications. It's my absolute pleasure to present our speaker today, Andrew Samit Magyan. Andrew is an associate professor at the School of Mathematics and Applied Statistics at the University of Wollongong in Australia, uh, and his interest basically revolve around the spatial temporal models and inference tools for environmental applications. Uh, he has published extensively in this field of dynamical spatial temporal modeling, Bayesian hierarchical modeling, modeling and approximate Bayesian inference. And he's very active and very nicely active in releasing software packages for that. Uh, he has been the recipient of many different important awards from the American Statistical Association, from the Bayesian Analysis uh, International Society, and the National Academy of Science in the US. Uh, and today's talk, we will see interesting takes, I think, on neural network amortization for geospatial data problems. Uh, I hope we can learn, actually, if amortization is the key to our goals, or it is just a dead end and a red herring, as, as Martin has, has, has put in the title. Um, so welcome, and thank you for being us today, Andrew. And uh, over to you. Really looking forward to your talk. Thanks a lot, Gustav, and uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I'll just share my screen now. Okay. So um, let me just hide the controls. All right, there we go. So um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, so my name is Andrew Zamit Manjan. Uh, thank you, Gustav, for the introduction. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, fast statistical inference with neural networks and amortization. So there's quite a lot in that title, and I'll, I'll slowly tear it apart in this talk. Um, I'm from the University of Wollongong, and uh, not, not, I'm sure not many people know where Wollongong is. So, so I thought in my first slide I'll, I'll uh, you know, uh, quench that thirst and, and show you where Wollongong is on the map. So, so it's in Australia, and uh, Sydney is just one hour north of Wollongong. Um, Wollongong is a, a seaside city. Uh, it's got a it's pretty big, I'd say, medium-sized university, um, and. And yeah, if, if anybody is, is uh, you know, down in Sydney for a holiday or for work and, and wants to visit, it would be, uh, it's always a pleasure to welcome visitors. All right, so this is, um, this is joint work with, uh, with uh, Matthew Sainsbury-Dale, uh, who is my PhD student who submitted, and uh, Raphael, who is uh, from, from Kaust in, in Saudi Arabia. All right, so a bit of a background, um, what, what I do. So I've, I've been working on uh, spatial and spatiotemporal modeling for the better part of um, maybe 15 years now. Um, and essentially what this is, is you get some data set uh, which is spatial or spatiotemporal, um, and you either need to fit a model to that to estimate some parameters in there, and those parameters could be interpretable, they could mean something important, uh, or you want to forecast, or you want to do both. So this has applications in um, conflict prediction, for example, that's something I worked on about uh, 12 years ago. Um, sea, sev sea level rise prediction, um, a, a recent project I've been working on with NASA is on um, predicting uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, sinks and sources so and estimating the, the fluxes from satellite data. So, so these, all these um, problems uh, involve big spatial or spatiotemporal data sets which uh, require um, some form of analysis, and in my case, some form of statistical analysis. So um, this uh, this webinar series is AI for good. So uh, I thought of uh, not just talking about uh, you know spatial statistics, but also how neural networks are affecting our field. So when you when you just look at the number of publications which contain spatial statistics and deep learning, up uh, ten years ago there was virtually nothing, um, maybe you know, a few papers here and there. Uh, but now we're counting you know, a thousand uh, per year. Um, 
and this this reflects, of course, the the recent growth in AI. So if we just look at you know how many publications contain the expression graph neural network, again, it's very very few comparatively uh, ten years ago to compared to what we have now. And uh, I'm, I'm choosing graph neural network because I'll talk more about graph neural networks later in the talk. So so of course um, AI is uh, change is affecting many many fields, and, and statistics is, is of course one of them. All right, so how do we use neural networks in spatial statistics? So, so as I said, many times we want to model a process so we can predict at unobserved locations, for example. Let's think of, for example, temperature. I've got some monitoring stations, and I want to predict the temperature where I don't have a monitoring station. Um, neural networks can give us the capacity to model very uh, flexible spatial processes, um, and that's what we've been doing recently. So that's spatial process modeling. Another place where neural networks can really make a difference is in emulation. So, so this is the case where you've got um, they have very complicated physics model, for example, that you that you need to simulate forward many times for various reasons, um, and this physics model could take a long time to run. Okay? So maybe it has finite elements, solvers, and things like that. Um, so what we want to do many times is uh, make a surrogate model. Which, which, which we can replace the full physics model. And uh, neural networks are, are very good at learning these complex mappings between the input to your simulator and the output. Okay, so we've been doing, we've been using the, that a bit as well. And the next thing is parameter inference. And this is what I'll be talking about today. So, so the idea here is we want to train neural networks to make uh, amortized parameter inference. And I'll talk about amortized quite a bit, um, but in summary, there are various ways in which you can do amortized inference, and today I'll be talking about possibly the simplest way, which is called amortized point estimation. So point estimation, um, what it means is that I want to just give you a best guess of a parameter. Okay, I'm not giving you a distribution, I'm giving you a best guess. The other methods will actually give you posterior distributions over the parameters. The word amortize means that um, I, I get these parameter estimates using a quick forward evaluation, in this case via a neural network. So um, what is amortization? So an official definition which I found on Oxford Languages is the following. It's the action or process of gradually writing off the initial cost of an asset. So in our case, in the context of neural networks, this uh, initial cost is that of training the neural network. So, so in order to develop this neural network that gives us a parameter estimate from data, um, we're going to have to train that, and that requires, and I'll show you later, a lot of simulations. Um, and, uh, and of course, then you need to do the training uh, on GPUs or on expensive hard hardware. So there's a big initial cost. Uh, but if you are going to repeatedly use that neural network for the same inferential task, then you're going to reap dividends, okay? That initial cost is justified. So this is what we mean by amortized inference. Um, this is a, a visual uh, which, which summarizes what I just said. So what I've um, plotted here is a, is a happy statistician with a client, and the client is asking the statistician, can you fit this model to these data uh, by the end of next week? And the statistician is smiling. Um, she has many tools at her disposal from you know, stand, maximum likelihood estimation, and things like that. Um, but now imagine the client says, can you fit this model you know, 100,000 times a day, every day, for the next seven years? Because data is coming in all the time, and we need to uh, fit this model. And, and of course, now this, this is not <laughs> it's a totally different ball game, um, and the statistician looks a bit worried. So amortized inference really comes into its own in these situations where you have to do inference many, many times, uh, you know, for potentially 100,000 times a day. Now, which sort of client will demand you to do <laughs> this sort of um, level of computation? And um, the, these, these clients, um, satellites, tend to be uh, very demanding. So what, what I've got a picture of here on the left is uh, orbiting Carbon Observatory 2. It is a, it is a NASA satellite. And this satellite was put into space about uh, 10 years ago now, um, so that we get more information on how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere. 
Now, of course, there's no carbon dioxide in space. <laughs> so, so the way these, these satellites work, they actually um, look at the intensity of reflected light from the Earth's surface. And uh, depending on, on what the intent, how, how the intensity is as a function of wavelength or, or frequency, uh, that tells us something about um, the constituent gases in the atmosphere of Earth. So if there's a lot of carbon dioxide, for example, certain uh, wavelengths will, will be more absorbed. The power associated with those um, wavelengths will be less. So, um, so in this case, uh, we, we observe Z. I'll be using Z to, to, to denote data. Okay, so Z is data. Um, but really, we want to infer what the carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. And I'm going to denote that as theta. This is the unknown we are interested in. And how are the two related? Uh, well, there is a, a for what we call a forward physics model, uh, which I'm denoting as H, uh, which relates uh, theta to Z. Okay? So, and, and generally speaking, it's quite easy, I uh, do easy in inverted commas, to go from theta to Z. But actually, we want to do the opposite, right? We observe Z, which are these intensities, and we want to go backwards to theta. So this is known as the inverse problem. And there are some uncertainties. That's, what I, that's why I put epsilon in there. So, um, so solving this inverse problem is actually quite complicated. As I said, this, uh, the satellite um, measures 100, does 100,000 soundings per day, or even more, actually. And, and all of these, uh, so that's 100,000 inverse problems that you need to solve per day, okay? So, so currently that takes a lot of time. And what we're seeing coming up, and there's this nice paper over here, is neural networks can be used to go from Z straight to the unknowns, okay? And I'll be talking about how we can do that later. All right, this is another example. So forecasting sea surface temperatures. So again, it's the same sort of system. So we've got Z, and Z is... Uh, the, the recent history of sea surface temperature, and we want to learn uh, theta. So theta in this case would be parameters in some partial differential equation which governs how sea surface temperature is evolving over space and time. So in this case, it's a simple advection diffusion type equation um, with where these parameters actually are changing in space and time. So uh, why would we want to infer these parameters? It's a classic forecasting problem. If we know what the parameters governing the partial differential equation are, then it's uh, relatively easy to predict what's going to happen at the next time step, which could typically be one day. So, so what people have done is they take the recent history of uh, sea surface temperature, which you can cast it to a kind of a three-dimensional array, space two dimensions, and time one dimension. And you can put that into a neural network, for example, a convolutional neural network. And you train this neural network so that it actually spouts out the parameters of this partial differential equation. And once you have those parameters, then you can you know, put that into your solver to get your, your next time point. Okay? And if you want to do this you know, at a local scale over the whole world every day, again, this is a process you need to be doing very quickly with minimal computation. So there's another place where amortized inference is really useful. Okay? So, you want a network, neural network where you just give it Z and it will give you theta straight away. Um, this is another example, the final example I'll be giving before I go into, into some more detail and to how, how these things work. Um, so this is now modeling uh, extrema, so sea surface temperature extremes. So there are some statistical models, we call them spatial models of extremes. Very difficult to make inference with. Um, they have what we call an intractable um, likelihood. Um, so they've got an intractable normalizing constant, which makes the likelihood intractable. Um, so making inference with these models is very uh, difficult, but they're very useful to have because they can tell us uh, things like if there is an extreme sea surface temperature event, this is the Red Sea, for example, what is the spatial extent of this extreme? Is it very localized or is it, for example, does it have a lot of spatial correlation? Um, so fitting, this is why we would want to fit these models. And uh, in the case of, of the Red Sea, there's a lot of uh, coral. Um, I went uh, 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 um, snorkeling there a couple of years ago. It's really beautiful. But there's also a lot of coral bleaching because of the, um, because of the sea surface temperature, of course, which is going up, like in most places. So again, we can simulate these uh, spatial extreme from these extreme spatial process models quite easily if you give, them, if you give me parameters theta. Um, but going the other way from the data to, to the parameters of interest is very difficult. Okay, so this is, again, another 
a place where amortizers to meters can be very useful. And there are countless other applications where actually having this, uh, this functionality um, would be very useful. Okay, so, so this work um, is discussed more in this paper which is published in uh, the American Statistician. All right, so um, I'll be talking about some ideas which, uh, which do appear in the paper, but um, what, what I'm going to do now is actually delve a bit into the math. Because one, one question which obviously comes up when you're using neural networks to do these things is, how do you know it's giving you the right thing? Can we trust it? Okay. Is it reliable? Is it robust? And, so, and to, to really start answering these questions, we must have an, a bit of an understanding as to what's going on underneath the hood. And then after I discuss um, a bit of the math, I'll give you an application, um, then discuss uh, some practical things to do with amortized inference, and then we'll conclude with, is it a golden ticket or a red herring? Okay, then we'll go back to the title. All right, so um, there are two in key ingredients uh, for amortized point estimation in a Bayesian setting, um, which we need to uh, first uh, establish. Um, the first one is Bayes rule. Okay, so the Bayes rule is as follows. Um, P of theta given Z, this, we call this our posterior distribution over our parameters theta. So you can think of this as our best beliefs on theta after we have observed the data z. And Bayes' rule tells us that we can express this as following. It's the likelihood function of theta. So what is the probability of observing this data z given theta multiplied by our prior beliefs on theta, so that's before we have observed the data, divided by um, what we call the marginal distribution of the data. Okay, so what is the distribution of the data without any information about the parameters? Um, so we will be using this quite a lot because it links the, uh, our best beliefs on, on theta after we observe data with whatever we have before. The second thing is the loss function. So the loss function quantifies the cost with getting, uh, with our estimate being wrong. Okay, so we have L of theta comma theta hat. Um, th this function here tells us what is the cost of theta hat not being equal to theta. So for example, if the true parameter of interest theta is zero and our guess theta hat, our estimate is one, uh, we could have a squared error loss, for example. Um, that means that our loss is one. Okay? It's one minus zero all squared, which is one. So it's as simple as that. Using these two, two ideas, we can come up with what is called a Bayes estimator. Okay, so a Bayes estimator is as following. Um, I'll talk actually about estimates first, and then I'll, I'll come to the estimators later. So a Bayes estimate for data Z and parameters theta is that which minimizes what we call the posterior expected loss. So we've seen what the posterior distribution is before. We've defined the loss function. But now what we're going to do is say, well, let's actually take the average over all possible parameters. And then we're going to find our, um, the theta hat, which is our estimate, which minimizes this kind of weighted average. And this makes a lot of sense. So, so there are lots of appealing properties of Bayes estimates. But you can also see that we really want to minimize the loss function in regions where our posterior probability is high. Effectively, this is what this is saying. Okay, so we're going to find theta hat, which minimizes the loss function um, in this region of posterior probability. Um, and another nice thing is that different loss functions lead to different estimates. So, for example, if the loss function is what we call the squared error loss, then the base estimate is what we call the posterior mean. And the posterior mean is, uh, say, it's kind of Many, many people relate this with the best guess. Okay, so, so the best guess of what my true parameter is, is uh, whatever the posterior mean is. Okay, because it's, it's my, you can think of that as the best belief given the data. Um, so unfortunately though, uh, s solving this problem is not easy. Um, there are a few things you could do which could be based on optimization. Um, but more often than not, you, you need to sample from your posterior distribution using something like Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, and sa that sampling process uh, could be very computationally intensive. And moreover, you need to do it for every data point Z. So, so if you get a new Z, you need to redo your optimization. Okay? And then you get a new Z, you need to redo your optimization. And if we're talking of, about something like um, 
a satellite, which I talked about, that is extremely computationally costly. And it's, it's actually hard to keep up. All right, so what I've done now is uh, created a, a very uh, toy, toy problem, uh, which, which explains uh, this in a bit more detail. So this is a very simple system where I've got one data point, Z, and one parameter estimate, uh, theta hat. And what I'm showing you the surface here is this posterior expected loss that we want to minimize for every Z. Okay, so, so this is what the surface is. So what happens in, let's say, classical statistics when you're doing classical inference is that you observe one data point Z. Okay? And in this case, we've got Z equals zero. Okay? And what we want to do is find the minimum posterior expected loss. So if we, if we are walking along this dotted line, what we actually get is this black line here. Okay? So, so you know, here it is high, and here it's low, here it's high again. So this is what gives us this curve. So traditionally, what you need to do is an optimization problem to find the minimum, and that could be using Markov chain Monte Carlo or some other uh, method. Um, and then we find the minimum and we say, great, that is my best estimate, I'm done. But you know, a few seconds later, another data point comes. And, and this time, uh, the posterior expected loss is looking completely different because the, the data has changed. So you need to rerun your optimization algorithm in order to find the minimum, right? Um, and that's going to take a lot of time again. But you run it and you, you, you find your minimum and you say, okay, theta hat is in this case uh, 2.25. That's my best guess. Okay, let's move on. But if you look closely at this uh, surface, actually there is, there is this curve here, this red curve, which you can trace along the minimum, along the valley. All right. And this is very important. So, so for this contrived example, I actually know what this red curve is. It's um, theta hat equals z squared, it's simply a quadratic, right? But the important thing is there is, there is a function here that I could follow, and, for which for every, and if I find what that function is, then for every z, I could tell you straight away what my estimate is without having to do any optimization. And this is, this is really the essence of a amortized uh, point inference. So, so if, I, if I find that function and I extract it, okay, so now I've got a function of how uh, theta hat behaves with z. Okay? So this, this function now is really useful because if I tell you z is zero, this is my data, I can tell you straight away what my estimate is. And if I tell you my z is 1.5, I can tell you straight away what my estimate is. Why? Because I've got this feed forward function, in this case, as I said, theta hat equals z squared, so I can tell you straight away what theta hat is for everything. Now, for in real applications, of course, this, this function is really complicated um, and uh, very high dimensional as well. So, so this is where neural networks will come in later. But um, bear with me for now while we go a bit more through, through, through this. So the, bigger quest, the biggest question is, okay, <laughs> let's, let's say this, this function does exist, okay? How, how do I estimate it? So there are, there are two options, really. The first option is, which is kind of the, the greedy route, you can simulate a lot of data. So you, you simulate a lot of situations, okay, for possible simulations. So, so again, in the case of the satellite, I could simulate lots of CO2 fields, carbon dioxide fields, and from that run them through the forward physics model to find uh, spectra. And then I run the inversion, the optimization, a million times to essentially find dots along this red line and then I can fit a curve through the line to those dots. But that entails running the optimization a million times. So, so that kind of defeats the purpose. The, the whole point of amortized inference is that we don't want to do that, right? The second option, uh, which, which actually I call the miracle of amortization, because this is what allows amortization to be possible, um, use this fact. Use the fact that since this estimator, the, this red line that I showed you before, minimizes the posterior expected loss for each set. What it also means is that it minimizes the area under the curve, essentially, for all z. Okay. So what I'm saying is that if you had to find um, the area under this curve, there is no other part which has a smaller area. And why is it important that I claim this? Because ultimately we want a single objective to train our neural networks, which we'll do later. And this gives us 
a sufficient condition that we need to satisfy. So let me give you a picture of this. So what I'm showing you here is the red line is the optimal estimator that we are trying to find. We don't know what it is, remember, okay? I mean, in the simple example, we can just see where the valley is, right, and then follow it. But in reality, we don't know where, what this line is. And the green here are just other candidate estimators that I've just, you know, invented <laughs> um, so that we could compare. And what I'm showing you on the right-hand side here is the, the, the function value, if I am walking along the red line, so you can see it's pretty high here, but then it's very white here, right? The function value is much lower, so the red line is doing this. All the other curves, sometimes they intersect the red line, as it's doing here, but they're always higher. What that means is that if I had to integrate any curve, that the integral will be smallest for the red one. In other words, if I train a neural network to minimize um, the expectation, an expectation is essentially an integral, uh, of the posterior expected loss, then I will ret retrieve this red curve. This is, why I call the, this is why I call it the miracle of amortization, because um, there's no inversion involved. <laughs> uh, all you need to do is minimize the, this integral. And, and why are we choosing E of Z here? So, so there are many, many integrals I could choose. Um, I'm using E of Z because Okay, now we need to go, this is the most mathematical slide, but every step is quite easy. Um, if I choose to minimize the expectation with respect to the data distribution set, um, from, to go from equation one to equation two, I'm simply writing out the definition of expectation. Okay, so um, if you've done some stats courses, you know that the E of X is the integral of X P of X, right? So, so that's exactly what I'm doing to go from this step to this step. Then I'm applying Bayes' rule. Okay, so P of theta given Z, P of Z is P of Z given theta, P of theta. Um, and then, to go from three to four, we do what we call a Monte Carlo approximation of these integrals. So when you've got any integral, um, if you can simulate from these distributions, so you can simulate from P of theta, and then you simulate from P of Z given theta, then an approximation to this integral is given by this sum over here. And those of you who train neural networks are probably very familiar with these sort of things, right? Because we have a loss function and we are minimizing uh, this empirical loss function. So, so these k's, these, these data points, the theta and z, would actually be independent draws from your simulator. So, so you can, um, so you can you, you, of course, you need a lot of them, let's say you know, tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands, whatever. Um, but then you get this empirical risk function, you can do stochastic gradient descent, so on and so forth to minimize it. And again, uh, it always blows my mind with saying this because there's no inversion involved. I'm not even inverting once, but at the end of the day, if I train my neural network um, to, to, to get me this estimator by minimizing this loss function, I would actually receive an optimal Bayes estimate. All right, so I jumped the gun a bit, but where do neural networks and AI come in? So, so the mapping theta hat is this un very unknown, very high dimensional mapping in most applications. Um, we're going to replace it with a neural network. Okay, so there are kernels or there are bias and weights which we need to estimate. So I'm collecting all of those in this uh, term gamma over here. Um, and then to, to, to train this neural network, what we are going to do is essentially find those gammas that minimize this loss. Okay. Um, where, we have, where we are simulating from our model. So literally we simulate from our prior distribution so again, the CO2 example, we simulate carbon dioxide, and then we simulate a spectra given our carbon dioxide, and we do that a million times. Okay? Um, and once you do that, then you use your usual deep learning libraries to train your neural network. All right, so I, I wanted to go a bit through the theory to show you that um, we know what we're doing. I mean, th there are still issues, which I'll talk about later in the red herring section, but um, when we train these neural networks, we are targeting a specific objective. We're not just hoping for the best that the neural network is giving us the, the correct answer. So, so um, you know, if, if we say we have an infinitely flexible neural network and things are well behaved, technically we should get to the optimal Bayes estimator, which we understand quite well in statistics. Okay. All right, so, and, and in the end of the day, it's really simple. You're going to have your neural network after you train it, you give it your data, and you're going to get your point estimate. 
and these point estimates would be targets, summaries of your posterior distribution. All right, um, let's talk a bit about uncertainty quantification because there is this myth, which fortunately is dying out, but, but maybe you know, five, 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 ten years ago it was, was quite strong that, that you can't do uncertainty quantification with neural networks. Um, so in this case, um, bootstrap is really simple. So, so what's bootstrap? Bootstrap is a way of getting uh, uh, confidence intervals or confidence sets associated with your estimator. And the way you can, you can do that is you estimate your parameter theta hat and then you simulate a lot from, from your fitted parameters, let's say a thousand times, and then you fit those, those uh, simulated data sets again. And that will give you a spread, and that is called the bootstrap distribution. And it's very easy to do once you've got an amortized neural network, right? Because you, you can get estimates in a split second uh, once it's trained. Um, but you can also go further and, and uh, find what we call uh, credible intervals uh, via the, the posterior quantiles of your posterior distributions. Because of course you can play around with this loss function. There's actually a loss function, and, and some of you I'm sure would know that, which is called the quantile loss function. Um, and then if you minimize that, then you actually get your posterior quantiles. And you can, and you can use that for, for establishing your credible intervals. Okay, so for your probability that your, your true parameter is within this, uh, this interval. All right, um, so let's talk a bit about now about architecture. So, okay, we, we want to do a neural network, but um, is, is there any type of neural network that we should be using? And um, this really depends on, on the data that you have. So, so if you are trying, for example, to estimate those um, uh, partial differential equation parameters, like those diffusion and advection parameters, um, you can think of the, the sequence of sea surface temperature images as a small video. And you can use a convolutional neural network for that. If you have time series data, RNNs, LSTMs, uh, CNNs. Um, if you've got graphs, uh, there are graph neural networks. Uh, if you have replicated data, permutation invariant networks. And this is, this is particularly important for, for Bayes estimators because we can show or we actually prove that uh, when you have replicated data, so independent realizations from your underlying process, the base estimators are permutation invariant. So, so there is a class of permutation invariant networks that you'd want to use in that case. Um, and uh, general unstructured data, um, you know, dense neural networks uh, tend to work quite well. So um, software, again, um, PyTorch TensorFlow, we've been playing around with Flux recently um, in Julia, which, 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 is, um, which is working quite well. Um, and uh, I've just listed some packages here. Uh, which, which can be used. So neural estimators is the package that, that we've developed here at Wollongong. Um, so this is written in Julia Flux, but we also have a, an R interface to it. And I'll show you some like uh, soon how, how, how that can be used. But there are also some other really great packages which are not restricted to point estimation. So, so Baseflow, for example, I was, I was at a workshop last week actually on this, um, implements uh, um, posterior approximation uh, in TensorFlow, um, and it's written in Python. In, uh, sorry, it's written in Python, but uh, I've managed to make it work from R. And uh, and SBI has just got a lot of nice packages, um, which we, and, and routines that you can call, and it's mostly based on PyTorch, I believe. All right, um, and many many these many of these uh, uh, packages are, are run in the same way because it's a form of simulation-based inference. Technically, if you can simulate lots of time from your underlying model, then you can construct an amortized estimator. Um, so, so this is just uh, showing what we do in our package, which is the R interface. It's written in Julia, but we have this R interface. Uh, so the first thing you need to do, of course, is establish what your architecture is. Uh, so for example, we want a convolutional neural network, so, 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 so that's what you do first. And then you really need only, only two other things, right? You need a function which samples from your prior distribution, and then a function which simulates data conditional on those parameters. Okay. And these would be simple R functions in this case, which you pass through to, to the package. Um, and then it trains, and then you can assess the estimator and see how it's doing and things like that. So, so generally speaking, they're actually quite easy to implement, and, uh, but I'll talk about some, some caveats later on. All right. So now I want to move on to um, uh, 
an, an application where we analyze global sea surface temperatures. So what we wanted to do here is uh, take, take global sea surface temperatures from, from the satellite, um, VIRS, um, uh, VIRS an instrument on board the Suomi and PP, and, uh, and analyze the residuals. So, so we, we remove a, a quadratic trend, which kind of explains a lot of the sea surface temperature and look at the residuals. Um, and uh, we want to analyze how the length scales and variances of the of, of the sea surface temperature residuals are, are changing in space, and, and ideally in time as well, although we just did it for one time point. Um, and to do this, what we did was we, we split the globe into 2,400 equally sized hexagonal cells, um, and we fit a very simple Gaussian process to it. Now, you don't need a mortise estimation almost for Gaussian processes because um, they're, they're actually quite easy to fit, but this allowed us to actually then compare um, to, to, to what you get if you don't amortize. And of course, you need, you need to validate these, these things. You can't just use them without extensively validating them. So that was one of the reasons. All right. Um, so there's a lot of what we call non-stationarity in sea surface temperature residuals. And what I mean by that is, uh, like here, length scales in the Brazil Malvinas uh, confluence zone, they're very small. So things are changing rapidly. The variance is very high. But then if we look here, for example, in the southern Indian Ocean, Things are relatively smooth, uh, long length scales, low variances. There's a high degree of non-stationarity, and we want to characterize that by fitting these Gaussian process models on all these hexagons. Um, but uh, it's a bit of a challenge with neural networks because the, the, the data points are irregularly spaced, so they're not on a, on a grid, for example. And also, the number of data points can change massively. So we've got a few cells with a few hundred uh, data points and a few cells with maybe 20,000 uh, data points. Okay, so um, so we're going to use a graph neural network, which which allows us to have this flexibility uh, for, to construct our estimator theta hat. Um, the nice thing about GNNs, they can be applied to these irregular spatial locations, and you can explicitly model the spatial uh, dependence. You can set the weights on the edges to be inversely proportional to the distance between data points, and, and this is something which. Um, uh, which makes sense in spatial statistics. We always assume that things close together are similar and that things further apart are not very similar. Right. So, so if, if you're not familiar with GNN, I just put this picture in um, to, to show you how, how it works roughly. So you, you have your, your spatial data points. Uh, here I've got four. And the first thing you're going to do is apply what looks like this complex operation. What all it's doing is, is, is doing some linear operation based on itself and its neighbors. And it's, but it's also weighting the neighbors by how far away they are from, from this node. Um, and then you go to, to, and then this one, you're doing exactly the same thing. Um, you do many convolutions, so although you have a scalar here, here you end up with a vector. But effectively, what you've got is what we call information propagation. So, so as, as you add more layers to the graph neural network, information starts to flow through the graph. Finally, then, uh, you're going to do what's called a readout module. And, and this, is this is a stage where we collapse the graph into a set of what we call summary statistics. Um, and this is a fixed length vector. And this is the crucial part, because it doesn't matter how many data points you have in the beginning, you're always going to end up with your same um, length of summary statistics. Um, and then we're going to uh, map those to the, to the parameter estimates. Okay, So, so this, is, this is basically our our base estimator, which is amortized after we train it. All right. Um, one uh, one caveat here is that the the missingness pattern really matters. So, if you just when training your neural network, if, if we just used fixed locations or locations distributed from a uniform distribution or something like that, it actually wouldn't have worked. So generally speaking, when doing amortization, it's really important that your model matches reality as much as possible, even more than in, than in classical methods. There's something called a distribution shift where, where neural networks, uh, where amortized estimators really start to perform poorly. Um, and in this case, the missingness or pattern, or rather the, the location of the data, is part of our model. So, so sometimes locations are clustered, sometimes locations are more uniform, and we need to pass that information to the neural network as well. So we simulate what are called these point patterns, and we feed those into the neural network when we are training as well. Okay, So the spatial arrangements are, are also changing. All right, so um, before showing you the results, just a quick simulation study um, showing that this 
works um, just with two parameters in this case, so, so theta is two-dimensional. Total training time for this is about 70 minutes on our uh, one GPU. Um, and we're also comparing to what is gold standard for estimation in this case, which is the maximum likelihood estimator. So, th so these are some, some results. So what we did was we changed our GNN and then we just uh, threw new data at it with different spatial configurations and see how it did. And we obtained what are called the sampling distributions of the estimator. So, so what are these? Th these are, you, you get your, your data, you simulate many times with this true parameter, then you estimate and you get these box plots. Right? So if you do it 100 times, you got these box plots from 100 parameters. So that gives you the sampling distribution. And you can see that the green, which is what we get from our graph neural network estimator, is very similar to actually to that what we get from our maximum likelihood estimator. There seems to be some bias here, um, but really it's not of too much concern. And, and actually, we see the maximum likelihood estimator sometimes. Um, the algorithm goes you know, haywire, or as the mode is is a bit far off. Uh, so, so yeah, it's um, overall we see we see it's very comparable to the gold standard, um, and the metrics show that. So the root mean squared errors are very close uh, for both of them. But this is the catch. So um, not the catch. This is the benefit. So the maximum likelihood estimator takes 1.2 seconds to estimate parameters from a single data set, while a neural network would require only two milliseconds. Okay, so it's about a 600-fold speed up. And this is, if you read papers in amortized inference, um, you know, 100-fold to 1,000-fold is a typical speed up that you can get by replacing a, ca a classical method with a neural network. We've also, um, we also get posterior uncertainties, and we see that those are very well calibrated. So we were, taking, uh, we were targeting 95% intervals, and empirically we got 94.7, 94.2% posterior coverage, which is very good. And this is, this is what it looks like in the end. So we, we fitted these 2,500 Gaussian processes to, um, uh, on a single GPU in three minutes. Uh, this would take much, much longer if you didn't have an amortized estimator. And what we, in the end, what do we get? We get estimates of the length scale, the variance, and the measurement error variance. And we all can also get um, coverage, probably, um, the interval, so post the uh, credible interval width uh, for, for the three parameters in this case. Okay, so um, we didn't really uh, interpret these. This was really just showing that, that, that we can do this. Um, but it's, it's, uh, for us, at least, it's really remarkable that we can do all these fits in, in three minutes on a single GPU, knowing that, again, we are, we are targeting, in this case, the posterior mean. All right, so golden ticket or red herring. Um, so this is my experience, and other people may have uh, different opinions. But um, personally, I think it is a golden ticket. I think it's going to change the way we do things in the future, um, mostly because it enables fast inference. And frankly, it even enables inference in systems that we couldn't make inference with before. So if we talk about models of spatial extremes, for example. Uh, people couldn't go beyond a few hundred data points. And with neural networks, we can go way beyond that. Um, so, so it's opening up new opportunities, definitely. Um, what I like is that they are optimal in a base sense, and there also, there's also uncertainty quantification, which can be done in various ways. What do we need to be careful of? So there's this amortization gap. Um, so what does this mean? If you remember the first graph that I, that I showed you, that red curve, uh, what if we don't fit that red curve exactly? What if it is a bit off? or it's a bit skewed, right? Um, so we think we're getting optimal estimates, but in fact, we haven't uh, fit this optimal estimator exactly. Um, so it's very hard to diagnose in high dimensional settings, especially. And it can give you a false sense of security, OK? Because the neural network will always give you, you know, an answer, <laughs> as we know. Um, and, and we can easily start to over-trust it. Um, you need many simulations. So I talked about, you know, 100,000 simulations, million simulations, and this number of simulations you need realistically grows with the dimension of the parameter space that you are considering. Um, you need high-end computing hardware if you want to solve really complex problems. So, so this kind of moderate problems we've worked on so far, you can get by with, you know, a single high-end GPU, but if you want to do something really sophisticated, you probably need much more than that. Um, and uh, there is unpredictable behavior when 
when the data doesn't come from the model you are assuming, okay, when it comes from a different model, um, it's in a part of, the, of your, of your uh, sample space which you haven't really explored with your neural network. So, so there's a bit of unpredictable behavior there, which you wouldn't really get with a classical method like MCMC. You'll get a posterior distribution. It will be a nonsensical posterior distribution, but um, uh, at, at least we kind of understand what will happen there. But with a neural network, I think all bets are off. Um, so, so that is something that is being looked into a lot as we speak. All right, um, this, I just scraped the, the surface here on amortized estimation. It's a fascinating field. Um, lots of people are looking at constraint posteriors, uh, very flexible posteriors using normalizing flows. Um, variational posteriors, this is variational inference, um, and it's actually variational autoencoders use a lot of these ideas. Um, there's a lot of work being done to tackle the amortization gap. Um, sequential methods, so, so this is this idea here is that you you, you, you develop an, an amortized estimator, you see where your posterior is, and then you train, you focus on that area, and you keep on doing this. So, so that you, you basically it's a way to reduce the amortization gap. Um, ways to robustify these for out of distribution data. And by the way, we've only talked about Bayesian methods, and <laughs> there's a whole um, uh, area on frequentist methods, uh, for example, amortized likelihood functions. Um, all right, so, so to conclude, uh, can you fit this model 100,000 times a day every day for the next seven years? And now our statistician is smiling because uh, she thinks she knows how she can do it now. Um, and that is all. Uh, thanks for attending, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you.